Welcome to the one within all. My name is Chance and this is Interverse, a podcast dedicated to the uplifting of truth, freedom, and harmony between ourselves and the universe. Now, we all know there's some seriously demented stuff happening in our external 3D meat space world these days. And with so many conspiracies against our health and happiness by cannibalistic corporations and vulturous governments looking to make a buck off of everyone they can, no matter the consequences, things can start to seem a little gloomy at certain points on our journey of expanding awareness. But as philosophers often point out, and I tend to agree, that as these dark clouds on the horizon, such as those created by chemtrails and carbon emissions, loom closer, we're being called to look within and recognize how our own image of ourselves and beliefs we unconsciously hold about reality are keeping us locked into an abusive and fearful relationship with the unknown. And although it's a fact that the more knowledge you gain, the bigger the circumference of the unknown in your mind becomes, it's also true that the darkness isn't always bad, and it always has something to teach us, even as it appears to us in the form of military, industrial, slow kill toxicity via pesticides and cell phone radiation, we're being given a chance to reimagine our culture, our relationship from nature, and everything else about life from the ground up by getting shocked awake through the numerous conspiratorial wake-up calls in our world. And it's knowledge of ourselves, mind, body, and soul that will be the key to rising above the troubled times we live in. And although things may be far from utopian in the world today, we have more access to information about solutions than any other time in history. My guest today is Joey Smith, a local in my hometown of Springfield, Missouri, who is a teacher of spirituality and metaphysics at the Self-Discovery Center, an organization dedicated to fanning the flames of consciousness for students who are looking for their own path. I met Joey at their Springfield Metaphysical Fair a few months back and was extremely impressed by his Organite creation and collection, and I had to pick up a few for myself, actually. We also had a fun time instantly connecting about many of the ideas I just brought up, and so having Joey on the show for a chat has been something I've looked forward to for a good while now. With classes like Seeker of Truth and Create Your Own Organite, there's both mental and artistic expansion being offered by this extremely friendly guy in front of me here. I'm really looking forward to getting to know Joey better in this episode. Before we begin, I have to remind you that if you want to hear the full episode extension and not just the free hour, check the show notes for a link to subscribe to Interverse Plus on Patreon and help support your favorite podcast by becoming a member. Get early access and double length shows with many other perks as well by signing up for Interverse Plus. And now it's time we jump right into this chat with Joey. I hope we resonate something within you today that inspires you creatively as you go about completing your greatest work of art, which is your life. Thanks for listening, everyone, and welcome to the show, Joey Smith of the Self Discovery Center. Hello, thanks for having me. How's it going, man? Good, good. So, what's in your world today? What's uh, what's on your mind? Well, I kind of came here to talk to you about um, Organite. So, do you have some questions to start off with with Organite, or well, with Organite, like? What got you into creating it, and can you talk about what it is exactly? Sure, yeah. I actually got into Organite because, well, let me back up there for a second, because I teach these spiritual classes, metaphysically and spiritually based metaphysical classes, and one of the things we teach in accordance to the power of thought is to keep your thoughts positive, keep your attention positive so that your life is going in a positive direction in the order of which you manifest in that way in a really you know positive way so i've been teaching these classes for about five and a half six years and then i came across through documentaries these things called chemtrails and they tremendously sparked my interest and i had such a huge soul urge to share about this subject but it's not the lightest or the most positive of subjects to speak about but I found myself nevertheless in the middle of my classes bringing the subject up talking to people about the subject I've even had some shorter kind of workshops and classes on chemtrails because it, it just really struck a chord in me that it's something that the world needs to know about but again not something that's very positive in nature and so kind of searching through YouTube and documentaries I actually have Gaia I don't know if you watch Gaia or not but it's a, it's a beautiful place in which you can actually see a lot of metaphysically based type documentaries and spiritually based documentaries and so on and so forth and watching Gaia I came across um, not only chemtrails but kind of a solution and that is the organite and so that's how I came across the organite was through finding a solution for chemtrails so that when I was speaking on this type of negative subject, if you will, I had that in one hand to talk about, but in the other hand, I had a solution to offer people. 
So with, with Kim trails, what have you discovered about them as far as the potential composition of the Kim trails? Um, you know, I think anybody that actually looks up and pays attention can tell that there's clearly something coming out of plants. That's not just condensation. <laughs> I mean, right. It's yes. very, mm-hmm. it's very obvious and in, intuitively obvious, but on, uh, furthermore, there's been a plethora of people who have been researching the topic for years. And if you just think back to maybe even the nineties, you wouldn't have seen the kind of clouds to the level that you see now in this geoengineering program. And there are even government government leaks that were official statements regarding geoengineering that have been made by officials that not, not in like a whistleblowing way, but just like, this is what we're doing. And <laughs> because, you know, one thing that the capstone cabal, if you will, or the, the shadow government or dark occultists that basically are, you know, psychopaths in charge of the governments of the world. They always tell us what they're doing, whether it's in fiction or just straight out in the open or in symbolism. That's one of the reasons why I just get disappointed when I try to talk about something like this and I get shut down completely by an individual. Because if you, if you start looking into it, then it's pretty hard to argue that there's at least something going on. And, you know, neither you or I is going to claim to know exactly what that is, but perhaps you do have some light to shed on what might be going on, the purpose behind it, or maybe what it is. Sure. Yeah. On chemtrails, kind of what I've kind of discovered is one, it's a lot of the heavy metals that they put in the atmosphere, bromium, aluminum, aluminum, heavy metals. And a lot of those heavy metals that they put out in the atmosphere dissipate and they come down to the earth. So not only do they fall on our earth, but they fall on ourselves as well. And so we're constantly breathing in a lot of these, these chemicals, a lot of these heavy metals. I think nowadays, um, things like, uh, asthma, it's such a common thing in people. And what's amazing is much of humanity doesn't even question as to why so many people have things like asthma, if you will. And breathing in these heavy metals over time, it accumulates in your system and cause. That's just one thing that the heavy metals can cause, the chemicals can cause. And they've, yeah. they've linked aluminum with uh, autism. Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. And although there's more than one entry vector for aluminum when you mm-hmm. consider vaccines and, you know, the fact that food it becomes a vector... For this stuff, not just what you breathe whenever it's falling from the sky. Yes, because it lands on your, your crops, all the crops as well. Mm-hmm. And aluminum is actually something our bodies are normally naturally equipped to deal with. But if it comes in through the wrong way, you know, if you're eating it, ingesting it, that's normal because there's a trace amount in dirt even without right. this mm-hmm. phenomenon right. going on. There's, it's just going to happen. Your body filters that out. But when you're breathing it in, I think it has a bit of a different effect because in larger quantities, especially, you know, because that's not something, and it's easy to see, say that that's not good because it's not a naturally occurring thing. Your body is obviously wouldn't be evolved or equipped to deal with that kind of particulate aluminum because absolutely. you're never going to run into that out in the jungle or something. Yeah. Not in the quantities that we're breathing it in. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it comes in a pure form. Absolutely. When you breathe it in that way. So it gets into the system at a much faster and stronger pace, if you will which wreaks havoc on the body. And then there's a lot to be said about just the blocking of natural light from the sun as well. The, fil- yeah, the filtering. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. When all biological life relies on that sunlight and there's mechanisms in our body that we don't even fathom or understand relating to sunlight affecting how our cells behave. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of like, why would we just go, why would we just let this go as an issue? <laughs> and, you know, it seems... Sometimes the unknown is good, but this is one of those unknowns where, yeah, it's an unknown, but it's obviously a bad unknown. Absolutely, yes. And that, too, it diminishes our, our energy that we get from the sun. That is a nutrient from the sun, literally, that the, the body needs to take in order to create its own energy, its life force. And to dim that energy and to keep a, a blanket over that, yeah, is, is harmful as well. Yeah, so let's talk about organite as far as... Uh, being a solution for this, you know, what, what is organite, what goes into constructing it and how does it possibly interact with our bodies in a way that could Im- impact this problem positively? Along with, with chemtrails that we're bombarded by a lot of times on a daily basis, on a daily basis, every day we're bombarded by EMF as well. All of that dirty energy, if you will, that electro- electromagnetic radiation that comes off our cell phones, our televisions, our computers, 
and they emit what's called a, it's a specific type of wave. It's a Hertzian wave that runs uh, counterclockwise, which is opposite of what the DNA in our body runs. Our DNA runs clockwise, and so when they hit, or hit each other, they counteract in such a way that it's harmful to the physical body. Now, organite creates what's called a stellar wave. It is the combination of metals, crystals, and a copper coil within organite that creates what's called a stellar wave. What that stellar wave does is helps to transmute that energy that comes off our equipment, our technology, if you will, so that by the time it hits the physical body, it transmutes it in such a way that it's much more harmonious to ourselves. It does much like our, uh, our mountains do, naturally for our earth. These elements are naturally in throughout our mountaintop. And so they naturally create this scalar wave which helps cleanse our ionosphere, our atmosphere, so on and so forth. And so these organite does it on a smaller scale which helps with the home, with all of the EMF, including the downfall that we get from all of that crud that we get from the chemtrail. Yeah, if you're boosting your body's physical strength just in general by having a positive type of energy through the scalar waves, which I, I could I could say a few things about that as well in a second, but that's going to make you stronger at filtering out everything, stronger at keeping you from getting sick. Just in general, it's, it's just, it's simple logic too to say something that has good vibes will make you feel better. <laughs> absolutely, yes, absolutely it will. I never thought about the fact that mountains themselves were like big organite clusters, but yes. that's super far out, so that's, you know, I was going to say, and this the mountain example is a perfect reflection of this, is that the, the scalar waves that come off of organite are like the same as the energy that you would get in a forest or something, and that nature itself works with scalar waves, creates those type of frequent energy frequencies and, and biorhythms. And our biology, there's like research behind this, look up like forest bathing, there's a whole trend in Asia especially of really stressed out people just going out to the forest for a couple of days of a month and healing all kinds of ailments. <laughs> and so what, what's going on is your body is used and evolutionarily it's used to being around a certain type of frequency. Absolutely. And that's the, the frequency of the biosphere of the earth itself. And when we're in these little Faraday cages, like this rectangular box we're in right now, which is my house, mm -hmm. all the waves coming off of electrical devices, like you're saying, are the opposite. Well, not the opposite, but they're just not the same as the natural frequencies. So Absolutely. the scalar wave frequencies being harmonious, I think, kind of overtake the, the negative, or not the negative, but the disharmonious frequencies. And one more thing I would say about how EMF actually interacts with our body, mm -hmm. which I think is important, to, important as far as like a scientific, physical, even material grounding for this argument that's been researched, is that frequencies interact with things that are the same relative size or dimension they resonate so if you've ever seen like glass breaking let's say from a frequency from a, a sound pitch it's because at that whatever that sound uh, pitch was there's a frequency that resonates with the molecules of the glass and that's what makes it all fall apart and shatter that type of phenomenon actually can occur through this type of emf radiation in that the the waves off of cer certain devices might be matched to a resonant frequency size-wise, wavelength-wise, that matches the approximate size of your organs or of your whole body. Or with 5G that's being set up and rolled out right now, that wavelength is like millimeter wavelength, and it resonates at the cellular level, doing damage directly to our cells. And it's pretty gnarly, actually, the more you look down this rabbit hole, and I think it is important that we start having this conversation to put the brakes on because I think so many people in Western culture just feel crappy and they don't even know why. Exactly. And there's a lot of reasons why, but this is a big one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely it is, yeah. The human body was created to vibrate with the planet that it lives on, the planet Earth. In fact, it's called the Schumann wave, if you will, Schumann resonance. And it, the body was created to resonate on that same frequency so that this is our home. This is our planet to harmonize with. And so I love to call it the heartbeat of the earth, if you will, and that we, we resonate with that same heartbeat. And EMF is, is not to that vibration. Much like you're talking about with, with the bridge, you have um, two different vibrations that come together, and for one of both of them, they can be catastrophic. 
so that you have the ability with sound to take down a bridge by just resonating at a completely different frequency. It vibrates out of its own dimension, if you will, almost, in that it comes crashing down. I've almost heard tell that 9-11, the buildings were taken down kind of in that respect. Yeah, that's that's definitely a far out conspiracy rabbit hole because there's so many different things that could, technology wise that are possible for how those buildings could have been destroyed that there might be a plethora of potential answers but obviously the one answer that is not the correct answer is that the planes did it absolutely right <laughs> very true yes yeah mm-hmm. well that was a that was just like the chemtrail issue is for us here now that was a big catalyzing force for a lot of people to start questioning what was going on in the world and i think on what we should be paying attention to right now is like the big marine life die outs that are happening oh, this gosh, year. Yes. Mm-hmm. Just this year, the Pacific Ocean went from like, you know, polluted and crappy to everything's dead. It's just like a desert. It's really crazy. This isn't all just like to be doom and gloom and freak us out, but I think we do need to be paying attention to this shadow stuff because otherwise, are we going to take it seriously that we have to change our relationship to nature? Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. Also can help us to find simple ways in order to keep ourselves more healthy, whether it's through organized or eating light foods, such as kale and lots of greens, can most definitely help um, chelate the body, help take out those those toxins, those heavy metals, if you will. Spirulina. So, I do a lot of spirulina. Do you? Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Which is an algae that's really good for that. Very good. Yeah. Awesome. Let's talk about maybe some other solutions in the realm of the power of thoughts, because I know that's something that you talk about in some of your classwork. Oh my gosh, absolutely, I do. I I have found it to be such a a powerful, powerful thing to come to an understanding that, one, everything is energy. Everything holds a frequency, and that includes our thoughts and our emotions. Our imagination in this society comes with the connotation that it's something that's fake, that's not real, where that couldn't be further from the truth, and that imagination is the purest form of creation. It's what makes us creators. It's what gives us the ability to manifest. And when it comes to the power of thought in this day and age, many people create and manifest because we are all creators and manifestors, but do it by default because they don't have an understanding that they are the creator of their thoughts, which, which floods the body with emotion and they have control of it all if if the world knew that my gosh what such a beautiful place we, we could be living in and we will live in eventually I honestly do believe that I honestly do focus my attention on thinking that way knowing the power of God I used to suffer from PTSD panic attacks I was allergic from everything to detergents deodorants foods Growing up as a child, I was allergic to the sun. All because in my manner of thinking and feeling, I was very sensitive to my surroundings. That physically was created in my body or manifested in my body to make my skin very, very sensitive to my surroundings as well. And I came across uh, this metaphysical school and started to learn the power of thought and concentrate on thinking positively. And I was teaching a healing class about six years ago. Um, a kundalini healing class. And I was just sitting there talking, and all of a sudden, it came to my awareness that, you know what, I don't have these allergies anymore. I can I can begin to, to wear fabrics and deodorants and things like that without breaking out like I used to. And I used to break out so bad that my skin would bleed. It was, it was, it was really, really bad. But dealing with my way of thinking and turning it around, in that moment, it was like this huge light bulb experience where I recognized that just, and not even trying to rid myself of of any of those ailments. But just recognizing that in that moment, I had a new pattern of thinking, and that thinking was thinking positive, if you will, made me realize in that moment that, oh my gosh, I don't have to deal with any of this anymore. And it does a tremendous benefit and gives you such a tool to utilize when it comes to things like panic attacks. I've come to realize that I'm I'm an empath, and for most of my life, I didn't realize that. And so, for most of my life, I really felt like I was crazy, you know? And I didn't have any idea that it's an actual gift and that I have the ability to really receive someone's energy and put it outward in a positive direction, especially if that energy is negative. For me, I, for most of my life, with my partner, I would go up to a register or what have you, and they would be having a bad day, and I would 
walk away feeling so accosted? Did you see what that person did to me when I didn't really know that they didn't really do anything to me? It was just I wasn't able to distinguish their energy from mine. And so recognizing the power of thought gave me the ability to do that as well, recognize their energies from my energy. And so that's why I teach the classes that I do today, because it has absolutely, absolutely changed my life, understanding the power of thought and the fact that you have the ability to control it. Again, for years, my partner would tell me, because I used to have tremendous anger issues as well. My partner would tell me, you know, just stop and calm down. And that would just throw me into a tizzy. It really will, because I'm like, what the hell do you mean stop and calm down? I, I, I can't. Because at that point in my life, I recognized, recognized myself as thought, as my emotion, not knowing that I'm creating it all by my attention in the first place. And so to come to that recognition was life-changing for me, absolutely life-changing. And that's why I do what I do today. So I think I can completely agree with your assessment about thought. One thing I've learned from mystics like William Blake, for example, mm -hmm. is that imagination isn't a form of thought. Thought is an expression of the imagination. And in fact, thought is just one of the tools of the imagination that it uses. But at the core, the wellspring of all reality and your experience of reality, which is actually all that there is as well, is all that you have to measure reality by is your experience. It's your attention and what you're paying attention to and what you're intending while you're paying attention to it that actually gives you what you get. I also have experienced the difficulty of having empathic abilities and not understanding them. For me, they manifested as getting really caught up in other people's behavior patterns that oh, I was gosh. around. Mm -hmm. I would just sort of, for my teenage years, I was just like this kind of chameleon that ex whoever I was around, that's what I acted like. And yeah, it was, mm -hmm. it was really psychologically scary for me because I was like get into this, these head spaces when I was by myself where I was like, who am I? I don't even have a personality. I just act like whoever I'm around. I, what's original about me? And it made me feel like there wasn't really for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it was getting into imagination exercises, if you will, getting to the point where I started doing things with my own creativity that took me out of that feeling. And all of a sudden, then I was standing my own ground. I was, it was coming from me, out of me, what I was saying and thinking, you know, yeah, I still learn a lot from other people. I spend tons, countless hours researching other people's thoughts in, in wow. various forms, sure. But yeah, getting into the creative practice itself, doing something that was uniquely me, whether it's just doodles or something, that actually was a huge, those were huge stepping stones, like from music to, to art to eventually creating this podcast, it helped me find myself and define myself. So like what, what kind of, uh, what kind of disciplines or possible avenues to creativity that you have, have done have helped you in that same way? Most definitely the organized is one. I have found myself, one of the things that we teach in classes is ideal purpose and activity. And one, recognizing that you are here on this planet and we all have our own individual unique gifts to bring to the world. We really do. Another word for it is, is Dharma. You know, you have your, what you have to offer this world. And then you have your things that you have to work through. But one of the things we most definitely teach is ideal purpose and activity. Ideal meaning, what do you think that you are here to do? And a great way to come to that in manner of thought, in manner of action, is recognizing what you're going to. As simple as, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? They're there for a reason. There's intention behind things that you enjoy doing because... When you enjoy doing anything, you are resonating with self. And so when it comes to ideal, that's what we're talking about, resonating with self. What do you have to offer? And then what do you, how do you see yourself offering it to the world? What's the purpose? How are you going to grow from it? And then your activities can be a myriad of things. For me, my ideal is to be an artisan of spirit for the purpose of constantly reminding myself of the beauty and sharing that beauty of the world with others. And then my activity is anything from doing woodworking to artwork, whether it's oils or, or what have you. Cooking. Cooking is, is another thing that comes easy for me, so I absolutely love to do that and share with it. And of course, teaching my classes. And then when I came across Organite after Chemtrail, it fit so in alignment with 
my ideal purpose and activity in that not only was it a piece of art, if you will, but it had healing qualities that came with it. And so that ideal purpose and activity resonated so well with the Organite. Yeah, and that one of the great things about creating Organite for yourself, beyond the fact that from what I've seen in the process, it's basically alchemy. <laughs> like you're using all the elements and fusing them together in this crazy way. But uh, the crystal structures can hold on to thoughts and intentions really powerfully. So not only does it have that natural energy of the scalar waves, but it's resonating out your intention that you put into it when you created it. Yes. And it's going to be all the more matched to your own personal field and vibration if it's around you after that. Like, so creating your own own organite is like even more powerful than just buying some or acquiring some somehow, I would imagine. Absolutely, because your own energy goes into it. In fact, I have to pay attention to myself when I'm making the organite because my energy in creating the pieces that I sell, that goes into it as well. In fact, I had a, an organite class a while back and he wanted um, me to create a piece for him and I decided to, to do that. It was really cool, but he wanted it to help with dream. And so I actually included things like malachite and amethyst and uh, labradorite, things that are conducive to the dream state, if you will. But when it comes to anybody, if they, if they come to a, a table that I'm at or they come to the, the center and they want to purchase a piece of organite, a lot of people really get stuck into the detail. And energy being energy and the law of attraction and like attracts like, what I tell people is, you know what, pick them up, play with them. What you find that resonates with you is going to be the one that is for you, regardless of what the stones can actually emit themselves, along with intention. You know, you can take a stone, you can take a piece of organite and actually hold it, set an intention with it, and then have it work for you in that way. And more often than not, I find people that come to a table, pick up a piece, put that piece down, go through a half a dozen other pieces, Always come back to the first one because that's what you resonate with. Like so attracts like, and it doesn't have to be this this complete understanding of knowledge when it comes to stones and exactly what organite is. Other than which piece do you resonate with? And I just think that in itself is a beautiful thing. I really, really do. I think crystals have an amazing amount of power that is completely unrecognized by and large by majority of people. I mean, I spent the most, most of my life not ever even seeing or being around crystals. It was like sort of a, a novelty. And I think they're becoming more recognized in, in the world today than when I was a kid, for sure. Yes. But there's so many things about crystals that are scientifically provable as far as in the material sense to be beneficial, but then on, on people's experience level, which is really what matters. So many people that get involved with with crystals for some reason or another will have amazing synchronicities related to them. One thing about like quartz, for example, is when you put mechanical pressure on it, it actually creates piezoelectricity and other crystal structures do this as well. So you're actually creating a small amount of energy just by squeezing a stone that you're holding. Absolutely. And it's going to be flavored based on the structure of that particular crystal and what it is. And so just that, just on that alone, you can, you can know that there's something going on with crystals. And then the fact that, like you said, our mountains are littered with these type of things. And mm -hmm. under the surface of the crust of the earth is more quartz, silicon dioxide than, or was it silicon oxide? Is that right? I don't know what, I, I tried to be smart. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like more quartz and, and, and crystals and gemstones than there are like rocks in some parts of the crust. So to me, it is evident of a, of a life form of sorts. Like maybe these are brain cells for the earth itself. Maybe they form an energy network grid that holds the consciousness of the earth. I mean, the earth has a magnetic field. Scientists that are in the material explana into material explanations of consciousness seem to think that there's some kind of correlation between the, the electromagnetic field, our bodies hold and create in our thoughts and consciousness too. And the other planets, the sun, they all have these type of fields and they interact with each other. So to me, it's a pretty strong argument to be made that consciousness is part of these forms that we call crystals or rocks. And, and in reality, they're a life form that just evolves and moves on a scale that's slower than ours in a way. And so we don't perceive them as growing or changing, but they are in a state of flux, just like other life forms. Absolutely. The whole physical itself is an illusion in itself because it's all 
boils down to everything is energy. And so absolutely, uh, crystals, stones, rocks, cold consciousness, half consciousness, if you will. I, it's funny to think because everybody knows that you can take this molecule or that molecule, put them together and create. That's how things come to be, if you will. H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. You put those two atoms together, create a molecule that turns out to be water, manifests in a physical way that turns out to be water. Nobody really ever thinks about the fact that how does hydrogen and water know to come together to create water? There has to be, there is consciousness there. They, they literally speak, energetically vibrate with each other on a certain level to create that manifestation in this regard, water. I, I love to give an exercise to my students and say, if you really want to know how alive we are, how connected we are to our earth, is find a plant that you enjoy or go outside and find a tree that um, you find beautiful. And just allow yourself to be with the tree without a lot of thought going on, but just in recognizing its beauty, maybe the, the sun filtering in from its leaves, so on and so forth, but just allow yourself to be with a tree and it's it's beautiful to watch if you're paying attention it's almost like looking through a camera and doing a kind of a zoom thing with your camera in that you'll recognize a tree here and all of a sudden you can see that because you are energetically connecting with the tree the tree will connect back with you and it will literally you can literally see it reaching out to you it's just a, it's it's a beautiful beautiful thing to see I've witnessed that kind of thing. Actually, psychedelics gave me a big perspective change on, really? on okay. trees. I think the first time when I used to experiment more with psychedelics, I looked at trees while on maybe mushrooms or possibly dimethyltryptamine, and there would be this breath that would be moving through the tree. You could feel it pulsing and vibrating. <laughs> Everything was kind of doing that, but... Definitely there's a, a life to the tree that I could all of a sudden see and I wasn't perceiving before. And now, if I, like you said, if I just take a moment and appreciate any tree, it's already looking like that instantly. Like, Absolutely, yes. Yeah, you once see you, it looking back at you, wanting to reach you like you're reaching it. Yes, it's a beautiful thing. It is, yes. Yeah, the trees are also, there's so many cool correlations between us and trees, like the fact that they help create the air we breathe and inside of our lungs looks like trees, little branching right. mm -hmm. uh, bronchial tubes and pathways. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess I would be interested now to ask you about more about the School of Metaphysics, the Self-Discovery Center, you know, what it is you're doing there these days, what else is offered there, what the community is like, you know, your hopes and dreams and plans. Just tell me everything about it. <laughs> yeah, well, we've, been, we've had the Self-Discovery Center for going on six years now. We actually took a metaphysical class, went to um, direct that branch, if you will. Things didn't work out six years ago, find our, found ourselves in kind of a conundrum in that we wanted to advance with our metaphysical understandings, if you will, but not having the opportunity anymore to stay with that schooling, uh, decided, you know, it was time for us to pick up our tools and utilize it. Rather than, at that point, it was kind of like sink or swim. Take what we've learned, because we had taken a, 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 we had made a huge transition from our living space into the branch, and um, devoted all of our time and space to that, to that energy, to that class, if you will. And so we didn't have a home of our own or anything, if you will. We didn't kind of give up our job so that we could dedicate all of our time to that. That not working out, it was like starting over, all over again. And so you said, you know what? It was a shock to the system to begin with, but then it was such a um, silver lining, if you will. It's just kind of a gift behind the scenes and that it gave us the opportunity to really take what we learned, pick up those tools, and utilize them. And so within a week, we had our our own home to, to teach out of. We kind of, the branch kind of came with us, so we started classes that way, and that's how the Self-Discovery Center began, began with, was by us uh, picking ourselves up from our bootstraps and saying, let's do what we believe we know how to do, which turned it into a kind of a knowing, if you will. And so we teach metaphysically based classes. Most definitely one of our, our largest draws is dream interpretation, learning to understand your dreams and know what they are, that they are messages from subconscious mind, from your soul, if you will. We teach uh, levels of mind, 
conscious, subconscious, and superconscious. Most people on a daily basis uh, use their conscious waking mind to assimilate, to calculate. All of that is bombarded by the five senses that we have, smell, taste, touch, so on and so forth. And so that part of the mind is a very, very busy, busy part of the mind. And so living in a very busy, busy society as well, that's a, that's a constant turbulence that's happening in the mind. And so many times you miss from a deeper level, from a calmer level, if you will, a more centered position, uh, where you're wanting to go in life, giving you greater direction in life. And that's the purpose of dreams, is shutting down that conscious mind, giving us a period of time within our sleep state, our dream state, to uh, converse with ourselves on a higher level. And so that's one of our biggest draws, is dream interpretation and learning how to understand the symbols and that dreams are um, communicating in a way that they're communicating with pictures and images, much like we uh, use with our own creative abilities and our imagination to manifest for ourselves. So it gives you an opportunity there to become self-aware in a completely different way, which again is other things that we teach, self-awareness. Understanding that you are soul, you know, you are energy, therefore you are limitless. I've heard many people say that, you know, I am so-and-so who has a soul, and that's almost there, but in actuality you're a soul that's experiencing um, the physical right now. So you are not the body, you're, 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 your body is just a vessel, if you will, in order to get around, in order to experience, in order to have an understanding of your creative powers, if you will, so that you are able to, with a sense of attention, manifest in such a way that it's it's not um, creating havoc either, although it can. But for example, what I mean by that is if you, if we were all able to manifest instantly by thought, as busy as we are with our minds, my gosh, how much more havoc there would be in the world. I mean, if you thought I could think of an elephant, all of a sudden there's an elephant in the room. And so, our, even, our process, even having that understanding of the process of creation and how sometimes it takes time to manifest certain things, it's, it's really to our advantage. So understanding and recognizing the power of thought and levels of the mind is what we teach most definitely. One of our, our big things that we go over is um, universal law, understanding universal law and how universal law works. We, see, we teach 13 of them. Now you can find a myriad of different labels for them, if you will, if you go online and such. We kind of stick with the 13 that we came familiarized with. They can be called different things most definitely, but in understanding Universal law really gives you a map at which to really navigate in this world. If you can recognize at any given moment which universal law is working for you, or which universal law you happen to be out of harmony with at the moment, it can give you such a great sense of direction. My favorite universal law happens to be the law of duality, because it is absolutely everywhere. And people see it as such a thing of opposite, when in actuality it's the it's the purpose of separation so that you can bring together something new. It always is. And so if you ever find yourself out of sorts in any situation, in any kind of way, you can automatically know that there is an offering of balance. If you're out of balance, there's offering, always, always an offering of balance, duality. So that, when it comes to universal law, happens to be my favorite. Of course, I think the most commonly understood is attraction. And so we work with universal laws and kind of give you the opportunity how to work with them, especially attraction. Many people think, um, okay, I want, I want um, this kind of finances. I want to move up when it comes to my finances. I want to have more money. And that's going in a positive direction when it comes to manifesting abundance for yourself, monetarily, if you will. But many people will go from that thought and think, how am I going to do this? You know, uh, this bill needs to be paid, that bill needs to pay, be paid. And so what actually happens is rather than attracting yourself in thought in accordance to abundance, most of your mind is spent in scarcity. And so a lot of times you have to, or all the time, you have to think about not only what you want to manifest for yourself, but how you're thinking about what you manifest for yourself. Because if you're not paying attention to that, you can really keep from manifesting for yourself. I have parcels. And um, coming into this at, 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 at an early time, kind of beginning to recognize the power of thought, so on and so forth, and universal law, I had set an appointment to get my, you know, everything that needed to be figured out to get my parcels. And so I set that appointment. 
And then by the time I got that appointment, I would say that I have no money in my pocket. So I'm going to reschedule the appointment. Chance literally for almost three years, I rescheduled that appointment until I came to an understanding of thought and attraction and so on and so forth. And that last appointment, I told myself, okay, you know what? I am going to keep this appointment and I will find a way to pick for it. Lo and behold, weeks later, I had my partial. Now, the, the, the amazing thing about that is all of that all. After all that time, that three years of telling myself, thinking in scarcity consciousness, if you will, that I don't have the money, the only thing that changed after those three years from not having my partials to getting my partials was telling myself, I'll find a way to pay for it. The money will come. And so just that simple shift in my thought and my energy allowed me to manifest. And so when it comes to most people manifesting, a lot of them create this victim mentality with themselves because they feel like the world happening to me when in all actuality they're, they're manifesting their surroundings they're semantic, manifesting what they're attracting to them people places things all of that is because of the fact that they're creators now again they do it by the, by default because they don't spend a lot of time paying attention to how often they think and what they think about so when it comes to that we have simple exercises that teach you um daily exercises that teach you how to get a hold of and a grip on where you place your attention and how you place your attention, what you're thinking about, how you're thinking about what you're thinking about by just simple 10 minute exercises. Great, great, great. <laughs> uh, that's that's kind of how I've come to recognize the law of attraction as well. You just do what you need to do and don't worry about it too much because what you need will come. And you just, you know, the other thing about it that I always like to throw in when we talk about attraction is that it's co it has a co-law, which is the law of action, which is that you don't attract anything without action that's in alignment with what you want to attract. Absolutely. So there's that as well. Sometimes that action can be stopping a negative thought pattern, and that's a form of action as well. Let's talk about what philosophies do you have about creativity and self-expression? <laughs> that's actually a universal law that we teach, is the universal law of self-expression. Yeah, like what? how does that tie into our our true higher self selves and also how, how do you feel about you know not looking at the body or the material world as pure illusion and not but not looking at it as the ultimate reality just as we don't we don't say there is no spirit but we don't say that it's the ultimate reality per se like would you agree that it's that middle balance point of seeing how matter is actually spirit and spirit uh, spirit is in the material and they're just kind of you know they're both there and it's not like one above the other right yeah what, what kind of my understanding is and kind of what we teach is that everything that exists right here right now in this third dimension on this physical plane this physical universe if you will is all come about because it is where our attention is individually and collectively so the fact that I am here speaking to you and you are speaking to me and we are in this building because our attention is on it here. That's what makes it exist. That's what brings those atoms and those molecules together. So we're, we are so much more powerful than we give ourselves credit for. And so yes, I do believe that it's, it's a middle ground. It's a stepping stone in order to enhance, understand ourselves as a spiritual being, as energetic beings. Absolutely. I, for the body, I guess the metaphor that I've been really liking lately is that if you look at a tree, to go back to our example of talking about trees, mm -hmm. a tree starts out as a seed that's just a tiny little seed that can become a hundreds of foot tall tree. But after the seed becomes the tree, the seed is gone it, for all intents and purposes. And so in that sense, you could look at maybe spirit as the seed that then grows into this material reality, these physical bodies. But then what is what those things do is actually create more spirit or create more seeds, if you will, just like a tree creates more of itself, um, of its original essence through the transformation of becoming a tree temporarily. Is, does that make sense? Through offspring? Is that what you mean? Yeah, like, um, well, well, yeah, the tree eventually be turns into more seeds, and so even if that physical form of the tree dies, the spirit, if you will, continues on infinitely through future journeys as other trees and it evolves generationally and human bodies are kind of like that too there's like 
a, a spiritual seed that grows into the physical body that we experience. But then that, that thing just, what that spirit is just moves between bodies as that process of shedding a body and growing a body ah, continues okay, indefinitely. Okay. Through, like through things like reincarnation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And we're not limited to just this physical reality either. Like you're saying, of course, because if you, if you start to bone up on your meditation practice, you'll find yourself in places that have no explanation at all that because you have no point of reference, you can't even remember what it was when you get out of the meditation other than, you know, that like, wow, I was with the aliens there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I guess like what, to go back to philosophy about creativity and self-expression though, I'd like to hear more about like how you see the law of self-expression playing out in the universe and define that a little bit more. Oh, okay. Another thing, one of the things that we teach on that note, let me sidetrack here for this sure. is one thing that we really get people to become aware of and we teach and recognize is the ego. The sense of I and an understanding that I am separate from you. Where it has its and it serves its purposes in that it allows you to have your own perception, attention. It allows you to have your own free will, separate from mine, if you will, so that you can come to this third dimension and work on what it is that you need to work on. It gives me the ability to do the same. It gives us all the ability as individuals to do the same. And it can also be um, a deter us from what we actually came here to do if we identify it with it too much. In that the ego, for the most part, will identify with the physical and the physical alone. And so we have this thing that's, that happens with all of us. We, we come in to a body. We are birthed into this world, if you will, and then we begin to figure out how to use our little hands and our little feet, and we learn to walk and talk and eat, and after those first seven years, also including those that we're surrounded by, we create what is called the ego, and we begin to, a lot of us, begin to uh, forget what we came in for, what exactly we are, and we begin to identify ourselves with the physical body and the physical alone, meaning that after seven years, Joey thinks that Joey is that physical body with brown skin and curly hair and brown eyes and and shy and so on and so forth, everything that attributes to that individual and that physical body, if you will. And many of us stay in that zone, if you will, not recognizing that we are soul. We are an expression of source. So many people will wants to pray or speak to this higher deity, if you will, call it God, universe, whatever you're comfortable with, and feel as though it's something outside self that they're they're praying for. When in actuality, the whole search is, is the search for the self and, and recognizing the self as something like spirit, something like soul when it comes so when it comes to understanding self expression and how we express ourselves from and in the world that's what we're talking about, coming from your soul perspective and expressing yourself that way, not going around the world and saying and doing whatever you want to according to your ego. That's expression, but it's not self-expression in the manner in which we teach. Self-expression is all about coming from your soul and expressing from there. So recognizing your, your gifts and your hobbies and the things that you enjoy doing and the people that you love and the connections that you make, recognizing that we are all... Um, really, really connected on a very high level. We are very, very connected and coming from that perspective and then from there expressing yourself in that way and going out into the world. Yeah, I think I'm right I'm right with you on all this and I could I'll, I'll flesh out a little bit of some of my thoughts I guess on the on the subject as well in that I even I kinda of look at the ego as having kind of some misconstrued uh, traits by some people in that there's another part of us psychologically, which is called the super ego, which is the, that is not the same as the ego ego. So there's the ego is like who you are in this body. I would even go so far as to say your body is what creates your ego. That's why like, that's why your ego actually gets healthier and less um, out of balance and crazy. The healthier your body gets. You have, Mm -hmm. you know, you have more problems with the ego whenever your physical body is in more distress. And with the superego, this is the voice in our head that's formed when we're young, like you were describing 
but that's the one that tells us that someone else is looking at us and telling us what they think about us. So it's like this imaginary character in our head that we carry around with us that tells us whenever we think that we should feel like we're stupid looking or like we're not good enough or adequate. So basically this is where we have to draw a line between recognizing the ultimate unity of all things, including the self and the collective of all other humans in the same space as us. Because if we let ourselves just be swept up by the collective, kind of like we were talking about with being empathic earlier, we'll just feel however crappy everybody else feels and we'll do whatever other crappy things other people might be doing. And so that's like, that's the super ego. And I think that if you get yourself spiritually, if you connect your, your ego, your physical self with your higher self, soul or spirit that's beyond lifetimes, it, which is actually inside you, not outside of you. So it's inside your body in a way like that seed that is inside the tree, even though it's now a tree. I think that's where you'll stop having unhealthy expressions of ego. Like you're saying something you're coming from your soul. You're not coming from this, this other sort of illusionary character that, it, you know, your parents tell you that you don't like this when you're a kid and you grow up thinking that until you actually break out of the box and realize, Oh, that was just an idea. And mm -hmm. you know, X or Y. So what, what practices or disciplines can you recommend or that you've been involved with that help you stay kind of in the sweet spot as far as not being too far to one side or the other, you know, collective or, or rejecting others. Most definitely one, but I find to be very important in meditation. Absolutely. I think that's the, that's the one that everybody can connect to, should do, is meditate. I think it, it has a, which is another thing that we teach, meditation, you know, and simple little little tools that you can abide by that will help quicken and deepen your meditation. You really don't. That's all really meditation is. It's, it's getting to your, your calm space, getting within yourself and kind of uh, communing, conversing from there, if you will. And, that can give us such a huge uh, sense of direction. Even if it's, even if you're not getting so much according to the conscious mind anyway, during the process of that 15, 20, however long, half hour that you meditate. You, but just that, taking that time in that space, in that quiet solitude, if you will, reconnects you to your super ego, if you were to super consciousness, is what we call it, call it absolutely, and that and that you you commune on a on a higher level a, from a clearer perspective with the true you, part of you that is source. Yeah, I think we're talking about sort of the balance between things. And when you look at all forms of the expression of the law of duality in reality, for uh, one of the primary ones is the left right schism in our own brains. Ah. Mm -hmm. And the word meditation actually means to carry to the middle or to bring to the center mm -hmm. uh, etymologically. So that's what you're doing. And I think when you look at any sort of fulcrum or p power generating system, there's always these two poles or two sides that in some way are interacting through a middle point to generate some sort of energy. Absolutely. Like the, the basic example would just be a seesaw or tear totter. It's on a fulcrum that's in the middle when while well, these two polarities go up and down and they reverse values with each other, like one's up, one's down, and then the other's up, the other's down. It's all happening because of the existence of that middle point that's completely still. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what the spiritual seed within us, again, to refer to that concept again, uh -huh. is actually the still point within, like the, the, the calm inside the storm, if you will. Absolutely. And yeah, going to that place, even for just a couple minutes, even if all you can, like, it really makes even a huge difference to sit down for two minutes, even if that's all you did. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> because as soon as you touch that spot, it doesn't, it almost matters not a lot how long you're there to an extent, because it's like, that's timeless and infinite in that place. So you can immediately get a huge jolt right, right away. And you might feel like called to spend more time there for, to balance things out, especially if you haven't for a while, maybe, but it's important to keep it up as a practice, but also for me, I have to just remind myself to do it when I can. And if I don't have a good discipline or practice about it, don't let that stop me from doing it whenever I feel that I need to. Right. Mm -hmm. I always find myself back at that sort of meditation altar eventually at some point in my life, no matter how strong and balanced I feel, there'll come a point 
where I'm like, oh, I really need this. <laughs> right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, dang, man. This has been pretty fun. I think maybe we should start talking a little bit about like where people can find you, what, what they could come and do at the self discovery center, kind of sort of wrap up and let you talk about, uh, anything you want to close with and, and ways people can connect with you and, and what to look for from, from you and your, your crew in the future. Awesome. Okay. Well, our center is called, it's called the self discovery center. You can find it um, online at the self discovery center.com. You can friend us on Facebook as well. If you'd like to, if you friend us on Facebook, that's where we do a lot of our conversing and advertising. So, Friending us on Facebook will get you all of the posts that we make and create for our upcoming classes, so on and so forth. We have a new Sadaka, Secret of Truth course, starting here on Wednesday, September the 8th. That is from 6.30 to 8.30. The course has 26 lessons, so it's at least that long. Um, it's a bit, a, bit, a bit of a commitment, of a dedication, but there, I have seen lives changed by them taking the course. We're here in Springfield, Missouri. We're at 837 South Ferguson Avenue here in Springfield. We actually have a little organized shop right there in our center where I sell my organite from. We also go to Ferris and stuff to sell the organite as well. On September 12th, we, at Saturday in the afternoon, from 12 to 2, we have an organite class. So if you want to come and create your own organite, put your own energy into that piece, we offer the modes and all of the materials needed. If by chance you want a specific stone to put in there or a specific charm or metal, you're welcome to bring that along with you. You'll walk away with a uh, two-inch pyramid, which is our normal size of pyramids that we sell. Yeah. Phone number? Can I put the phone number out there? Yeah, sure. The phone number, you can reach us at 417-894-2577. And I'm excited about this new class coming up. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good one. And our... I have had such an awesome time at our organized workshop. So if you're interested at all in creating a piece, come on in. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I'm going to have to get over and do eventually. I think the, uh, the time you just set for that one, I'm going to be at a magic festival. Oh, cool. All right. You heard about mm-hmm. that one coming up? No, the, I have it. The gathering mountain. Uh, uh-uh. well, it's in Eureka, near Eureka Springs in Arkansas. I actually learned about it from somebody who's the uh, person who's throwing it. She was, she had a booth at the metaphysical fair and that's where I met her and found oh, out about okay. it. So All right. Very cool. it's kind of connected. Awesome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, that might be something that turns into an annual thing and maybe you guys can link up, but her name was Desiree Fultz. I don't know if okay. you, you yes, contacted Okay. Yes, I recognize her. the name. Yes. The mm-hmm. Psychic uh, Insights Astrology. She's really cool. I think that event is going to be super fun. Beautiful. Yeah. So I'll be out at that, but I'll stay tuned for the next build your own organite workshop because I'm well, like that. Planning on having it the last Saturday in October will be the next one. Great. Yeah, because I've never made my own. I, I feel like that'd be a good thing to do, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of fun. So hopefully, maybe some people will come your way and and check into what you guys are doing. And I hope that people benefited from this talk. I know I sure had a good time. And thanks for coming on, Joey. Yes. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, pushing me outside of my own comfort zone and allowing me to grow a little bit more and share. I much appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Is there anything you want to leave people with? Stay positive. Don't get down on yourself. I know no matter where you are right here, right now, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Brilliant. I could not agree more. (laughs) All right, well, we'll wrap this up, and uh, thanks for coming over, and thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for having me. We got through another great episode. Not even a screwy recording could stop us. Thanks for sticking through this conversation, even though the audio quality on Joey's side had some problems. It's not like I mess up recording on purpose, but it gets tricky when I'm doing episodes in person instead of over the internet. I have less experience with that, and it's partially an equipment issue, but the rest you can blame on my novice audio engineering abilities. I'm only bringing it up to say thanks for not getting annoyed. 
and sticking with me through that great chat with Joey. I'm sure as I progress as a podcaster and maybe get a few more plus subscribers, I'll be able to get better gear and mitigate some of those sound quality issues. And I really think we only scratched the surface on some of these title topics like chemtrails and Organite. If you want to follow Alice and disappear down some rabbit holes, I highly recommend you do your own research on this stuff, especially on Wilhelm Reich, the father of Organite. That's a fascinating guy. It may be cliche to say, but it's easier and easier for me to see that we're all just forms of energy in transition that's based on our intentions. There are so many brilliant minds out there who have things to say about how our beliefs end up giving structure to the reality we find ourselves in, but in the end, it does us no good to hear these things without believing in ourselves to make the magic work. And if the woo-woo aspect of this type of metaphysical talk turns you off, there are even highly credentialed scientists who demonstrate the same thing we're saying from a material perspective. I, for one, have always loved the work of Dr. Bruce Lipton, who wrote a book called The Biology of Belief. Google that name and find a podcast or interview he's done. I can promise you that checking out Bruce is going to upgrade your belief in your own ability to influence your body's health and wellness through changing your mind, just like Joey talked about in relation to his allergies. So yeah, go look up Dr. Bruce Lipton. I love his most recent appearance, uh, I think sometime last year on Unslaved Podcast, but he's been, he's been all over the internet. It may seem counterintuitive to be talking about other things uh, than just positive mindsets and constructive beliefs when it comes to spiritual and physical well-being, such as chemtrails. You know, that seems like such a negative topic or the cabals of sorcery wielding controllers that we talk about, you know, that run the world from behind the scenes. It's actually better, though, that you know about the toxicity in your environment and maybe start pulling on that thread that leads to the shadowy characters that have been working against nature and society for centuries. Knowing the bad stuff that's out there actually can help you create psychic and even physical immunity to the dangers by taking them out of the realm of the unknown. Your mind can empower your body's defenses by you making the choice to remain healthy and sane regardless of what's happening in the world. And even better, you can use your mind to formulate solutions like creating your own organite or using medicinal foods to detox. Most of you listening will have heard the free version of this show, but we expand on these topics in great detail and talk about a lot of interesting subjects in the second hour of the episode, which is exclusive to subscribers. In the plus extension, we discussed the relationship of personal responsibility to freedom and the external controllers, our perceptions of darkness in the world as we're awakening, how following things that give you good energy always leads you to good places, being sacredly selfish and knowing that self-betterment also helps others, more about the arts and attractions at the metaphysical fair put on by the Self-Discovery Center and its future goals, reasons for adding musical performers to the metaphysical fair, a discussion on recommended movies and how great works of art reflect ourselves back to us, and a taste of ideas and advice about dreams, one of the class topics at the Self-Discovery Center that Joey teaches. And really, that's only scratching the surface of the Plus content. I can't give it all away in the outro, but you can trust it's as good or better than the free show because the second part of a conversation is always more in-depth since we cover the foundational stuff in the first part. Check the show notes for links to patreon.com forward slash interverse where you can sign up to become a member, start getting those extended episodes, and early access to podcasts. Not only do you get the extra content, you're also supporting me in this podcast journey, which is currently quite a lot of work, for very little in return. I hate ads. I would never sell your time with this podcast by inserting any. So there's not really any other way for me to get funding other than subscribers. And come on, you made it this far. So you clearly are not averse to the idea of getting an extra hour tacked on, are you? Anyway, I hugely appreciate my current patrons. I hope to add more of you soon, though, because I really want more people to hear the awesome archive of Plus shows that's been getting bigger and better. Speaking of links you can find in the show notes, also check there for Joey's Self-Discovery Center. Links to the Create Your Own Organite workshop in October for Springfield Peeps, and a link to the music in this episode by French producer Han Ka. I discovered Han Ka through the alternative social media site Minds.com, which I would not, uh, I would not say you should necessarily pick that for your alternative social media use. There's a lot of options out there, but I'm there, and you know, come say hi if you've got a Minds account at Interverse. I was immediately impressed though with Han Ka. The imagination behind his beats is extreme, and I highly encourage you to go follow his profile on SoundCloud. 
show some love to this great artist who puts all of this stuff out for free download. But that's it for me. I'm getting ready to leave for the Gathering Mountain Festival of Magic and Lore. Really hope to see some of you there. Wish me luck with my first time taking this show on the road, getting a booth. Should be a very interesting learning experience for me. And also the first time doing a live podcast, which will be Saturday night at that festival. I do hope to see some of you there, like I said. And thanks for listening. Love you guys. See you soon.